Bass Therapeutics is leading the way in developing treatments for sickle cell disease. We're proud to sponsor the Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative in its mission to provide leadership, education, and support services to the sickle cell community. Hi, I'm Gary A. Gibson, your host for the Sickle Cell Action Network Internet Radio Show. If you are impacted by sickle cell disease in any way, whether you are a patient, a caregiver, or a friend, you need to join me every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. I promise that you will find our show to be full of information, perspective, and opinion about all things sickle cell. See you Tuesday right here on RadioNext.tv, the Cool Groove site. Hello and welcome. You're listening to the Sickle Cell Action Network, a weekly internet radio show presented by Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative and sponsored by Mass Therapeutics. We're coming to you live from Indianapolis, Indiana, and we're here to serve you by providing up-to-date information and opinion on all matters pertaining to sickle cell disease. My name is Gary A. Gibson, and I am your host for the next two hours. Let me start by saying that I don't have sickle cell disease, nor do I carry the sickle cell trait. In spite of that, I am no stranger to sickle cell. Quite the contrary. You see, even though I don't have sickle cell, it has had a very huge impact on my life. That's true because its complications took my wife from me after 12 years of marriage. It also caused her to have a miscarriage that resulted in the loss of our twin babies that she was carrying while in a sickle cell crisis. So all told, sickle cell has taken three lives from me, and I feel the pain of those losses every single day. I currently serve as the president and CEO of Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative, a community-based organization that has been serving people with sickle cell for over 45 years. Each day I attempt to transform the pain of my losses into positive energy, energy that is focused on making a difference for those who are battling sickle cell. From being involved with sickle cell for over 40 years, I'm able to say that much progress has been made, but there is still so much work to do. This show is an opportunity to contribute to the ever-expanding dialogue about sickle cell that is taking place all around the world. Our show is about raising awareness, but it is also about so much more. I like to say that sickle cell awareness is important, but we need more than awareness. Those living with sickle cell are already aware. That makes me ask, so what are we doing for them? My answer is, not enough. That's why we've named this show the Sickle Cell Action Network, because awareness without action has very little impact. We want this show to be a source of information and a call to action to help those who must live with sickle cell in their midst. We have designed the show to provide information that is beneficial to patients, caregivers, family members, and friends alike. Most importantly, we want people with sickle cell to know and understand that they are not alone. The Sickle Cell Action Network show features live guests who are health care providers, patients, advocates, and others who are engaged in the fight to eradicate sickle cell and ease its burden on those it affects. Today, we are pleased to have a special guest who will speak with us about her struggle to survive sickle cell and the success that she has had in doing so. Joining me today by phone from California is Ms. Judy Gray Johnson. Ms. Johnson is the author of an autobiographic book called Sickle Cell Disease, The Struggle to Survive, and she is also a co-founder of an organization called Sickle Cell Educational Resources. We're very happy to have Judy with us today. Before we get to the today's topic, however, I want to share some of our upcoming topics with you so that you'll know what we're going to be doing. In future weeks, we'll cover such topics as the role of the caregiver, sickle cell's narcotics dilemma, traveling with sickle cell, connecting the sickle cell community, and many, many others. So as you can see, we are serious about sharing valuable information, and we hope that you will join us every week, same time, same station. If you've missed some of our previous editions or wish that you could listen to them again, don't worry. Just go to the Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative YouTube page and you'll find them there. Now let's get on with our show and we'll start with this week's edition of Sickle Cell News Update. So the first uh, article that we're going to share with you today is titled Sickle Cell Disease, Nurses Need Better Training, Says Health Union. And the article reads... The NHS, or National Health Service, needs nurses to be better trained in dealing with sickle cell disease, a union has warned. The Royal College of Nursing described a poor level of awareness and knowledge in accident and emergency units about the potentially fatal disease. Sickle cell disease is the name for a group of inherited conditions that affect the red blood cells, the worst of which is sickle cell anemia. It affects about 15,000 adults and children in the United Kingdom. 
The union discussed this issue at its annual congress in Glasgow on Saturday, June 18th. The disease can cause episodes of severe pain known as crises which will kill if not treated correctly. Despite a higher profile, there are 5,000 fewer United Kingdom patients with cystic fibrosis than with sickle cell. Sickle cell adult specialist nurse Carrie Johnson, who submitted the item to the union's annual congress, said, There are some really good specialist services in pockets around the country, but too many people have to rely on general hospitals and accident and emergency where there is a very poor level of awareness. Two things would make a huge difference in the thousands to the thousands of people with sickle cell disease. First, provide more specialist services, and secondly, provide better health care staff with better training about the condition. So throughout his childhood, Stephen Taylor, 21, of East London, went into hospital on a monthly basis for blood transfusions, and he would often have to stay in the hospital for up to three weeks during severe pain episodes caused by the condition. He said, growing up with sickle cell disease was really hard. It affected my personal life because a lot of my friends didn't under this, understand the disease and didn't realize while I wouldn't socialize. Hospitals make you better physically, but emotionally they make you worse. Some people think you're addicted to painkillers because you ask for them first thing in the morning. It's very distressing, very upsetting. It's hard to keep calm when you're in so much pain, Stefan said. He also said the specialist units for sickle cell disease were brilliant, but there were only a small number of beds and the system needed more funding. The Royal College of Nursing also cited a survey carried out in December 2015 by the charity Picker Institute Europe, which asked patients if they thought healthcare staff had a competent knowledge of sickle cell. Only 45% of the 229 recipients who had all received urgent or emergency care within the previous six months said they felt nurses had a good knowledge and understanding of the condition. Janet Davies, Chief Executive and General Secretary of the Royal College of Nursing said, Nurses are clearly saying that there is not enough training for healthcare staff working in general settings on sickle cell disease. People who are already suffering a great deal of pain need the very best and most informed care. The solution to this is very simple, she said, better training and better, better awareness amongst healthcare staff and the public. A National Health Service England official said, sickle cell disease can be an extremely debilitating and distressing condition, which is why National Health Service England is committed to providing patients with the highest standards of treatment, care, and support. So this is not only a problem in the United States of America, but it is also a problem in the United Kingdom, who has far fewer patients than we have here in America, but the story is the same. Nurses need better training, and so do the doctors. Our next uh, article is um, released through the Black Voice News and several other news outlets that I saw. Um, and this one is titled, Pfizer Officials Call for Blacks to Participate in Sickle Cell Disease Clinical Trials. The article reads, June 19, 2016 marks World Sickle Cell Day. In the desire to help create a greater, greater awareness of sickle cell disease and increase their efforts to find a cure, Pfizer invited members of the black press to meet and discuss with key members of their rare disease medical and management staff the state of sickle cell disease and their search for a cure. It is estimated that sickle cell disease affects approximately 100,000 Americans and one out of 365 blacks in the United States, according to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. About 1 in 13 blacks are born with sickle cell trait. Nisha Foster, the Senior Director and Corporate Affairs Lead for Pfizer's Inflammation, Immunology, and Rare Disease Unit, introduced the participants who shared why they've been so devoted to creating greater awareness about sickle cell disease and the opportunities available to assist, to assist those who struggle with this debilitating disease. Sanja Banks, the CEO of the Sickle Cell Disease Association of America, Inc., shared how alarmed she was to learn in 2010 that in a hundred years of discovering the sickle cell disease, only one FDA drug had been approved and it wasn't even for sickle cell. It was just as heart-wrenching then as it is now to know that our people are still going to hospitals as their medical home. Why don't we have a cure? Pfizer's chief medical officer, Dr. Frida Lewis Hall, recalled the joy she initially felt interning at Howard University Hospital after graduating from medical school. 
But when she attempted to ease the pain of a toddler living with sickle cell, that joy was replaced with an overwhelming sense of futility. I heard an unbelievable piercing sound from a toddler in a sickle cell crisis, said Lewis Hall. I tried to hydrate her and provide some pain relief. It was at that moment that I realized how helpless I was without the tools. And this is an important story because we cannot um, overemphasize the importance of being able to conduct clinical trials to find treatments for sickle cell disease, and I'm certain that we will be talking about that in much more detail as we go forward. Our last article today comes from Lagos, Nigeria, and the article headline is Lagos Plans Policy on Sickle Cell Disorder, and it comes to us from Nigeria today. The article reads, Lagos State Ministry of Health Sickle Cell Control Program Coordinator, Dr. Olayamoke Oyanuga, yesterday disclosed that plans are on to formulate a policy on sickle cell disorder which affects over 4 million Nigerians. Speaking at a media workshop at the Sickle Cell Foundation Nigeria in Lagos, she said the state government has a policy on sickle cell disease, adding that work on this has not been concluded. According to Oyanuga, a committee on sickle cell disease was inaugurated earlier this year and plans are ongoing to produce a comprehensive work plan for management of the disorder in the state. She further noted that a technical team which includes academics and health experts on sickle cell disease, has also been set aside by the committee. And by the time this is included and presented to the governor, more activities on the project would spread all over the state. All these activities are part of the developmental process to make sure we implement the proposed policy, she added. Oyanuga, who represented the health commissioner, said that part of the activities the policy would highlight on, if eventually implemented, is prenatal diagnosis and free screening in the state's health facilities, among others. She added that, this is still an ongoing work and I cannot precisely give you a time frame, but as soon as this is confirmed by the technical team, it would be communicated answering questions on plans by the state to establish a facility for bone marrow transplantation, a remedy for the disorder. She stated that bone marrow transplantation is a cure for it, but I would not want to say much about this because there are still some things that are being done underground. Oyanuga explained that without money, we cannot do so many things, but when there is enough funds and a willing government like we have now, a lot would be achieved. We have four years and beyond so I believe things would get better with time. She informed journalists that the state's health facilities offer treatment, diagnosis, and capacity building for both patients and health care givers respectively. And at the ministry level, we have produced information materials which we distributed to health facilities and individuals, she said. So Lagos, the state of Lagos in Nigeria, says that they are working on a plan for dealing with sickle cell in the state of the country that has the highest rates of births of sickle cell in the world. That's our sickle cell news update for today. We're going to take a break. And when we come back, we're going to start speaking with Judy Gray Johnson. This is the Sickle Cell Action Network on RadioNext.tv. I am pleased to uh, tell you that we have on the phone with us um, Judy Gray Johnson, who is the author of a book called Living with Sickle Cell Disease, The Struggle to Survive. Um, and it's an impressive book, and that's obviously because she is an impressive lady. And as we go through our discussion today, I'm certain that you'll, you'll agree with me. Um, so first thing I'd like to do is just welcome you to the show, Judy. Well, thank you. Glad to be with you. Great. Now, um, what I always do at the beginning of a show is I ask uh, the guests to tell us a little bit about themselves so that the people that are listening get a sense for who they're listening to. Um, so I'm going to ask you to tell us a little bit about yourself. Tell us where were you born? How old are you? And I know it's not polite to ask a woman how old she is, but when we're talking about sickle cell, that's sort of a different matter. And especially in your case, people need to know how old you are. Um, and then tell us a little bit about what your hemoglobin type is, please. Right, okay. Uh, well, uh, I was born in Kingsport, Tennessee. Uh, that's just across the state line from uh, Virginia. 
uh, you have uh, Gate City, Weber City, Virginia, and then over into Kingsport, Tennessee. So I was born in the hospital over there. And um, I have um, spent about 40, nearly 40 years in education, in public education. Uh, so having taught the uh, elementary, middle, and high schools in Virginia and Maryland. And uh, my hemoglobin type is SC disease. Now, let me say this, uh, that um, while I have uh, written this book, even though I don't necessarily consider myself a writer, uh, but I do have a lot of experience, not just the disease, but the uh, experience of going through the educational system. Uh, with this disease as well. Right. Now, you didn't tell me. How old are you? Oh, <laughs> I'm, 70, I'm 73 years old. And uh, this it is uh, important to note that because when I come in contact with other sickle cell uh, people, uh, they, you know, they will say, oh, well, somebody, told, my doctor told me I, I, my, uh, I'm not going to live past a certain age and all. Well, I'm at that stage where, believe me, nobody told me anything about any life expectancy uh, because obviously being 73 years of age and uh, I was born in 1943, just 33 years after they had put a name whatever that uh, strange little uh, uh, thing was uh, that was causing so much problems in our bodies. Uh, that's when they put the name sickle cell because it looked like the you know, the shape of the sickle. And, um, <coughs> but, um, yeah, so no one told me. Uh, so I never thought that, uh, that I was going to live to a particular time, at least, you know, not right away. Right. Right, and and that's why I want to bring it out because you know your your age is is something to to let people know that you know do not listen to what people tell you when they're talking about those life expectancies. Those life expectancies are averages. A um, whole lot of factors go into them, but I just certainly want people to know that you can reach age seventy three and beyond. And so, thank you for being open about that. So, Judy, uh, many, many people think about writing a book, but, but they never do so. When did you first think about writing your book, and why? Well, seriously, um, I guess maybe um, perhaps in my 40s, uh, early 40s, maybe I started thinking about it. And I think from there on, from time to time, I would think about it, but not seriously. Uh, I guess maybe the, the obstacles was I didn't have the confidence in myself uh, that I could do it, or even what I had to say was that important, and that, uh, what am I going to write about, you know? Uh -huh. um, what was I going to say about it? And things kept happening in my life, uh, uh, not only within the community, within the uh, workplace, within the community, within the uh, workforce, uh, within the uh, um, medical f of, of, of field, uh, going to the hospitals and doctors and so forth, that I said, I've got to do it, I've got to do it. And I think that um, the idea of thinking that, well, if I don't, well, first of all, I didn't have anybody, anybody to discuss it with. You know, uh -huh. problems that would crop up. I mean, who am I going to go to and, and talk about these issues? And if I had called someone up and said, let me tell you what just happened to me. And this happened so many times, I said to myself, no one is going to believe me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just sort of sucked it up and kept it to myself. And uh, as I continued to go about my business of just living, you know, there's so many things that came up. I said, I've got to do it, I've got to do it. But there was one thing that happened to me uh, in, um, I guess, in my 50s. Uh, some, sometime in my 50s, I had a, a real bad crisis. I went to the uh, emergency room. And um, the doctors, I mean, I was treated so poorly in that uh, I was screaming uh, in pain. I just could barely stand it. 
and it seems like their response was to move me from one, the regular population of the, in the emergency room over into a corner by myself. And um, they said, well, the doctor will be with you soon. Well, soon was like almost forever because I'd been there a long time. And what pushed me over the, the uh, edge was a doctor, a female doctor came in, stood over me, and she had a male nurse with her. And she was sort of elbowing the nurse and as if to say, watch this. And she leaned over and said, tell me, Mrs. Johnson, are you taking any narcotics at home? Yeah. And it was that one statement made me think about all that I had been through over the years in trying to survive and trying to do what I'm supposed to do, be a good citizen and uh, take care of my family, to, you know, to work, all of this. And then we've come to all you see me as uh, is a... Uh, a dope addict. I'm here seeking for drugs. That was very offensive. Uh, I was highly insulted, uh, but I, there was nothing I could do at that moment. So I responded to her, and of, and of course I said, no, uh, I, I'm not taking any narcotics home, so on. And uh, But I knew that once I got through that crisis, I knew exactly what to do. Uh, wasn't necessarily going to um, buy the book at that moment, but I knew how to handle the situation. I was going to report them, and I re believe in going up the chain of command because I started with the uh, patient advocate for the hospital, and they eventually got rid of her because she did a, a magnificent job of bringing to the attention our, uh, you know, concerns are at the hospital. But uh, I started there, and uh, because they did get rid of her, you know, that was the end of that. And so then I went from there to um, the uh, head of the, um, what, the emergency room, um, who, and then I went to the head of the hospital, and from there to who, the, the agency that regulates the medical profession, um, with the uh, doctors and the nurses and so on. And I did not like the response that I got from any of them. And I said, this, that is really what pushed me over the edge. Okay, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be asking you to talk about some of that in, in a little bit more detail as we continue our discussion because it really is important. And it's important for people to know that they can take action into their own hands as you have done and I'm going to want to share how you've done that uh, but so once you decided to go ahead and write this book and you got started how long did it take you? Well you know I want to think that perhaps it took me uh, maybe seven or eight years only because I did not sit down and write it all just then mm -hmm. okay right and uh, I would start and stop start and stop and uh, so you know but the information had been you know um, uh, twirling around in my head for some time so it's hard to say that I started on a particular date and ended on a particular date it okay. just didn't work that way okay Okay, um, and so you, you, you sort of mentioned, did you have some obstacles, you know, obviously sickle cell crises and things like that, but were there any other obstacles that, that tried to keep you from getting this done? Well, only, uh, only within myself and that, you know, I had, to, uh, I had to do a lot of research before I wrote the book, and what was important to me was trying to just find out, okay, what has already been done out there? What has been said about this disease? And making sure that people believe me. And um, so the obstacles were, I, I didn't really find much of anything that had been done out here. I, I found the information of, uh, from the medical point of view. Right. The doctors, uh, but 
there was nothing from the patient point of view. It, well, within one book, maybe I saw a paragraph of something that someone had, had written, and I thought, this is not telling my story. Uh-huh. This does not address what real what the issues really are within us, and so um, and so uh, you know, and, and a lack of confidence, I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. Sure. Um, so. I'm going to ask you one more question, then we're going to go to break here. Um, in the dedication book section of your book, you say that, I wonder how I have endured so much pain throughout my life. It's been a few years since your book was published, and I'm wondering if you now have an answer to that question. Uh, well, uh, I still wonder how <laughs> I have endured so much pain throughout my life, because there was nothing that I could look to, to find out what it was going to be like. Where was this this, this pain heading to? You know, where uh-huh. was it going to lead us? How, how did it, um, you know, how did it uh, manifest itself, let's say, in years past or even in the future? Uh, what do I have to look forward to? So, um, yeah, I do wonder how I've endured so much pain because I did not know what to expect in the future. I just continued on. I did not give up. You know, I just continued on. Well, then I think maybe uh, I can help you find the answer to your to that question, and and that is so that you could be here to share your story, um, and in sharing your story, inspire others. Mm-hmm. Well, that sounds good. So we're going to take a break. Uh, this is the Sickle Cell Action Network. I am your host, Gary A. Gibson, and we'll be back shortly. This Welcome back to the Sickle Cell Action Network. I'm Gary A. Gibson, your host. Um, Before we get back to Judy Gray Johnson, I do want to uh, put one plug in here for the 20th annual Sickle Cell 5K Walk Run that we are uh, presenting on June 25th, 2016 at 8 o'clock in the morning at the Riverside Family Center here in Indianapolis. Um, as I said, it is the 20th anniversary walk run, and the walk run is um, the um, the premier fundraising event for Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of people come out, and we certainly would like to have you come and join us if you're in the vener- general vicinity of Indianapolis. Um, or if you would like, you can certainly donate to the cause, um, and you can do so by going to our webpage, the Martin Center Sickle Cell Initiative webpage at www.themartincenter.org. Um, and as soon as you land on the page, you see a big logo for the 20th anniversary walk run. All you have to do is click the logo and it takes you to the registration site where you can either register yourself, a team, or you can even just make a donation. And trust me, we appreciate any donation you are able to make. That's www.themartincenter.org. We are speaking with Judy Gray Johnson, the author of Living with Sickle Cell Disease, The Struggle to Survive. And this is an outstanding woman. Um, And I'm going to continue the discussion by saying that, um, Judy, on page 7 of The Struggle to Survive, you say that you went about your life with a superficial knowledge of sickle cell disease. And I think that's true for a lot of sickle cell patients. Um, Would you agree? Yeah, I would agree as well. Okay. Because the, the knowledge is not there in terms of, uh, you know, there's not that many people that you can ask, well, what is it like, you know, what happens and all of that. So, yes, it's superficial. There's so much more to know about this disease well, than and what is known. And one of the things that's happened in in your life, um, and and I know that you also are involved in social media now, so one of the things that's happened in your lifetime is that it has become a little easier for those with sickle cell to learn that they're not alone, number one, and also to know that there are other people that are out there with the same illness that are willing to share their stories so that people can feel a little bit more connected and a little bit more knowledgeable, much more so than before we had the internet and the ability to connect um, on social media. Would you agree with that? Uh, Yes, I would. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Um, So, 
You also mentioned in your book that the frequency of your pain crises increased as you got older, and I've, I've heard this from several different uh, patients. What is your frequency like these days? Is it still pretty bad, um, Little, I mean, more than it used to be? Well, it is pretty bad, but there are other issues that crop up. Uh, while the pain is still there, uh, but not as intense as before, um, let's see, it has been approximately seven years since I have had a real bad crisis. Wonderful. But let me, but let me before you say wonderful, <laughs> let me explain. <laughs> right. <laughs> let me, you know, because uh, other issues crop up. Right. I now have, I now have, um, a kidney disease. Okay. okay? Uh-huh. Now, what does that, and that is impacting upon the, upon my uh, situation, my uh, health crisis now. Uh, number one, I'm on two, I'm, I'm, on, I'm taking two medications. Number one is uh, hydroxyurea. Good. Uh-huh. And uh, number two, I'm taking Procrit, a shot of pro on a weekly basis. Okay. Okay? Uh-huh. Now, I think that it's because I'm taking those two uh, medications that is what has kept me out of the hospital for approximately seven years in a pain crisis uh -huh. uh, as bad as I have had in the past. Now, uh, what's important about the Procrit, I can only, well, you might say, well, that's a good thing, but I can only get Procrit because I have the uh, kidney disease. So if you don't have kidney disease, somehow uh, they say you cannot have it. Huh. They will not give it to you. Okay. So uh, don't ask me to explain that. Uh, you know, the, the doctors can do that. Uh, but that's the only reason I'm able to get it. Uh, I suffer a lot from uh, extreme exhaustion. Right. And so uh, that Procrit helps me, okay, with okay. that. Okay, good. Well, thanks for sharing that. Do you think, obviously, then, that the hydroxyurea is helping, too? Uh, yes, it's my second time uh, on it. I tried it for a little while at first, and then I quit, and then I had to go back to it because the pain crisis was so frequent okay. uh, that, you know, I just had to try it again. Okay. And so the second time around, uh, it seemed like it's working. And yes, I do believe it is working, uh, because if I don't take it, I can feel the results of it. Right. All right. Well, we we're we're very big uh, proponents of hydroxyurea, and we urge all sickle cell patients um, to at least give it a try, and we urge doctors that we come in contact with to at least give a try prescribing it. So, I just wanted to just hear from your end if it if you think it's effective or not. Um, uh, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know, back to your book. Um, I read about your childhood and. You talked about feeling isolated as a child, and you also talked about how your older sister, Linda, was like your alter ego. Would you expound on that a little bit for us? Well, Linda was 18 months older than me, yet she was put in the position of taking care of me like a mother. You mm -hmm. know, not a sister, but like a mother. Uh -huh. I come from a very... I came from a very poor family um, in the mountains of uh, southwest Virginia, Gate City, and uh, people had to work, and they did work, and uh, so my mother had five children, and uh, it was difficult for her to go out and work a menial job, and yet take care of this one child, I was, the, I, I was her problem child. I, not only was I a problem child uh, at home, but I was a problem child in the community because we didn't know any other person in the uh, community that was uh, suffering as I was suffering. So, uh, in other words, I was a crying child and no one knew why I was crying. And uh, this went on for about uh, 15 years. And so, uh, because, I, uh, and when my mother would find the five dollars to take me to the doctor um, all he did was just prescribe liniment right now I'm sure the audience knows what liniment is and some may and not some, <laughs> well, some. It's, it's a topical thing you know mm -hmm. you, you splash on your 
of, you know, your arms or whatever limb that's bothering you. And uh, he says, well, it'll, you know, it, it'll get better. But yet, my, and my mother did exactly what the doctor said do. But the important thing to know here, it gives you a window into how people treated the poor. They never associated um, poor health with maybe a hospital visit might be in order. You know, uh, right. Uh, the doctor never ever recommended that my mother take me to the hospital. Wow. Uh, so, in other words, I was treated at home for 15 years and with liniment. And uh, how did that stop the pain? It just wore off. So I was isolated from the rest of the community. I didn't go out to play uh, very much unless my older sister Linda was with me. And, um, you know, so uh, otherwise, I was home sitting alone. So many, uh, so many what? sickle, I'm saying so many sickle cell patients can relate to that, what you've just said. Yes, I mean, you know, so anyway, there would be, you know, so that's the isolation, you know. So, in fact, I'll tell you, when I was a child, I never had a person that I called my friend. Wow. You know? Wow. Uh, to, to play with. That's just the way it was, you know? Uh-huh. And uh, so I waited, and, you know, my my uh, sister, Linda, she directed all of my activities, you know? She uh -huh. took me out to, uh, when she thought it was, uh, she had time to um, play with others, or she'd tell me to stand aside or to sit down on the side. Uh, of the road or something, you know, while, you know, they, I could not run around and play with the other kids. Or oh, she'd tell me when to go home and so on. But, um, yes, it, it, was a, it was a very trying hot time. Very, very trying. And Judy, is, is Linda still with us? Is she still alive? No, no, she's been dead now for many, many years. I think she died in 94. Okay, so you've outlived your sister who didn't have sickle cell, is my point. I said you outlived your sickle, your sister who did not have sickle cell. That's my point. Oh yes, yes, you're you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. In fact, I was the only one in my immediate family that had the disease. Right. Um, right. That was bothered by it. Wow. You know? Wow. And we don't know whether anybody had the uh, trait or not, because people just didn't get tested back then. Right. You know. Right. They didn't. You know, um, I'm going to ask you one more um, question or ask you to actually read a little bit from your book for us, and then we're going to take a break. But uh, on page 22, you told us that you had decided to stop feeling sorry for yourself, and I thought that was really powerful and moving when I read that. I think that that was a really powerful statement. So would you please read that section for us, um, just that okay. little bit there? All right. As I advanced into my teens, I decided I had to stop feeling sorry for myself and try my level best to overcome my sickness. I crossed the state line into Tennessee to go to high school. I wanted to become a majorette, just like Linda. So I did. Concentrated on that goal did wonders for my sight, taking my mind off my intermittent pain. I did not worry about my malady because if I did experience an episode, Linda was always right there to help me out. I participated in sporting events and parades, which I loved. The trouble with this was those activities caused me to spend my entire day's allotment of a valuable currency, my energy. With nothing but fatigue left in my tank, I went home and crashed my head into the phone through my bed. What I did not know then was that the cold fall and winter weather would be a precursor to the pain. I tried to ignore my illness, and I pushed myself to new heights, trying to be a normal young person, just as Linda did. I took on odd jobs to earn spending money for myself. I washed dishes for 50 cents babysat and performed light housekeeping. However, these jobs were temporary, and whether I could do them or not depended, of course, on whether I was having a pain episode. It was at the age of 15 that I made an important decision. 
I told my mother I wanted to leave home. My mother showed obvious relief. She had done all she could do for me and could do no more. My Aunt Amanda, who lived in Corpus Christi, Texas, agreed to take me in. When my time to leave approached, my Aunt Ruth in Barnwell, South Carolina, had just died. The plan was for me to meet my Aunt Amanda in South Carolina at the funeral and return to Corpus Christi with her. My rendezvous with Aunt Amanda would prove fortuitous. The next chapter of my life would provide a badly needed answer to the riddle that was my health. Judy Gray Johnson, thank you for reading that section from your book, Living with Sickle Cell Disease, The Struggle to Survive. This is the Sickle Cell Action Network. I'm Gary A. Gibson, your host, and we'll be back. Welcome back to the Sickle Cell Action Network. I'm Gary A. Gibson, your host, and we are speaking by phone with Judy Gray Johnson, the author of Living with Sickle Cell Disease, The Struggle to Survive. She's talking to us live from uh, Los Angeles, Calif- I mean, uh, Valencia, California, which is just north of Los Angeles. Um, and we're really delighted that uh, she's, she's sharing her time and herself with us today. I'm going to pick up... Uh, where we were leaving off a little bit earlier, Julie, Judy, and um, you said that uh, in your book, you said that you didn't actually get a diagnosis for sickle cell until, until you were 16. And the, doc- the doctor who diagnosed you didn't even tell you directly, but he told your Aunt Louise, and she never told you about the diagnosis directly. So how did you finally learn that you had sickle cell? Okay, let me just say this. You have to understand the times, okay? Yes. I grew up in the 40s and the 50s, and that was the time, you know, listen, adults did not talk to children, and even at 16, I was considered a child. So when my aunt took me into the the doctor's office, and he did his examination and gave me the um, uh, blood transfusion and all, he spoke over me directly to her. And, um, you know, so, I mean, as a child, you just learn to not interrupt adults. And so, you no, know, he never talked to me directly and said, you have sickle cell. Uh, but uh, what my aunt would say later on only is, uh, only the only thing she said was, uh, the doctor said you have sickle cell. Okay. Now, well, what does that mean? Yeah. That means nothing, you see? They just said the word, period. With no explanations. The, with no explanation at all, and I was afraid to ask. Right. Because, because I said, now, if it was that important, she would have said something. Somebody would have said something, but they didn't. And I thought... Oh my God! Well, I, I didn't really want to ask uh, ask any more any questions at all because I knew it was bad. The crises were horrible, and the pain was it was so excruciating. I knew that, and whatever name they gave it, that's what it was. I didn't want to know about why the pain was so bad, right? And what it meant. So I never asked questions, and they never told me. Do you? Do you remember your very first, or the first pain crisis that you were aware of? Do you remember how old you were, or about how old you were? That I remember yeah. is around three or four years of age. Okay. Walking along the road there in Gate City with my mother, and all of a sudden, uh, my arms started hurting really bad, and so... Uh, I just started screaming in pain. And so my mother quickly took me home and uh, I guess did whatever she thought, you know, like be still, put a warm cloth over my arm or something like that, but the pain just wouldn't go away. And so she took me to the doctor and uh, described all all of the uh, symptoms and everything. And that's when the doctor gave her liniment. <laughs> that's when you started on the <laughs> liniment. <laughs> that's right. Wow. And so, you know, take her home and use this and, and it'll be okay. And so believe in the doctor, you know, that's what my mother did. Sure. And because I continued to cry, it frustrated her even more 
because she was not being a bad mother. You know, she was doing what she knew to do and what the doctor told her to do. Right. And yet it was not good enough. And so it was it was a terrible time. Terrible yeah. time. So for 15 years, uh, first 15 years of my life, that's what it was. Let him it. Wow. Incredible. Um, so yeah. did the doctor at age, at, after your diagnosis at age 16, did they start giving you something else then? No. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, no, because um, <laughs> this is the thing. Uh, I was in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, this is the doctor there that made the diagnosis. I was there for the summer. Okay. And um, so, uh, after, frankly, after they gave me the uh, transfusion, I was uh, like a new person. Right, right. So then I went back to my normal activities, and I guess by the end of the summer, you know, my time there was up, and I went from there back to my grandparents in South Carolina, and, um, you know, so until the next time. No one ever, ever gave me any pills or anything that I could take internally to help ward off the next crisis or anything. And um, so, if, as long as I was not screaming and hollering, I guess they thought everything was fine. So I waited until the next crisis and started crying, and it would be the same thing again, liniment. Wow, jeez. <laughs> okay, uh, Judy, um, I'm going to sh- shift forward a little bit. And, and on page 30, you told us about your experience with the Civil Rights March, which I found quite interesting. Uh, would, you, would you please read some of that tale for us? Okay. Uh, Those remaining years at South Carolina State were relatively uneventful, except for a few days in 1963, when my stubborn tiredness lifted long enough for me to go to jail for participating in a civil rights march. South Carolina State served as a safe oasis for African-American college students. Every now and then, however, students who ventured off campus found the surrounding town of Orangeburg to be a jungle of racial hostility. Blacks were harassed, spat upon, denied service in stores, and sometimes even arrested on trumped up charges. Okay? Uh, you want me to read some more? No, that that's where I wanted you to stop because I, I really wanted uh, folks to hear that, you know, not only were you um, fighting sickle cell, you were also fighting racial discrimination and and that also appears to be one of the earlier signs of your um your uh inclination i think is the word i'm looking for uh to activism uh you got involved and that's really important and i think pretty cool and if i'm not mistaken when i read that you you were there with dr martin luther king uh yes i was i mean it was a big deal i mean listen there were so many issues that you know, that we were fighting at that time, and to be honest with you, I lived. I came from a, a small town in Southwest Virginia, uh, with a handful of blacks, in a town of uh, let's say four thousand whites, uh, and very few blacks in the area. I did not know discrimination the way that we know it. The, uh, uh, that I would find out later. You uh-huh. understand? Right. It was just a way of life. And when I went to South Carolina, it was so blatant there. Uh-huh. You know? Right, right. Um, Anyway, we won't get into that. Well, I like how I like how you described it in the book, where you were saying that um, there in Virginia, it was more about who had money and who didn't. And then when you moved out and went up into South Carolina, is when you really saw real racism. Well, you know, that's true. Uh, especially, it was extremely hot in South Carolina. When your family has to walk uptown in the heat, and, uh, you know, you might want to stop and get an ice cream cone or an, uh, a, a, a soda. and uh, But you had to go in and go around to the side of the counter to get whatever you're going to get. Right. And then take it right out the door. You couldn't even sit down to enjoy it. Right. So, I mean, listen, we had a lot of challenges there. And so when I went to South Carolina State, I, you know, I was there with kids from all over the state who had similar experiences. So, uh, and then, of course, by Orangeburg, 
of being, uh, of, you know, as terrible as it was, you know, because it, we, we would live on campus and we, we were not allowed to go off campus without permission and uh, because for many reasons. And one of the reasons was because we were not treated very well by the town's folks. But uh, anyway, I mean, I felt like I had to be a part of that movement. And uh, I didn't think about, oh, I have this disease and something's going to happen me, to me if I participate or whatever. I just didn't think at that moment I was not going through a crisis. And so I ended up being arrested, put it in a, uh, a field, and of course, they hauled it. In fact, we filled up the jails and the field. And they took, uh, about midnight, they brought in two buses. One bus to take the males to the men's prison in Columbia, South Carolina, and the women's prison. Um, they took us to the one in South uh, Columbia. And uh, as they were booking us in, uh, they asked us to sign something, which was a blank page that had lots of names, excuse me, lots of lines there. And they wanted us to sign them with nothing written there. No, oh, and kidding. so right. And because I and three other persons refused to sign it, I mean we didn't know what we were signing. If we had signed it, they could go back and put anything in there. Right, right. You know? Right. And but because of that they threw us into solitary confinement. So I was in solitary confinement for four days. And um, it, it was, uh, in, in, in all total, we uh, spent about a week in the prison. And of course, along the way, we met the uh, people there, the uh, inmates there. Some people were there for murder and, uh, you know, other things, um, robbery and all of that. And I said, oh my God. Well, you know. <laughs> not a good place. Not a good place for a person with sickle cell disease to be. No, that, that's true. And I guess, you know, I'm not, like I told you earlier, I'm not a very religious person, but I think that somebody must have been looking out for me. <laughs> right. Because uh, I did not go into a crisis. And uh, so I was able to, to, you know, weather the storm for about a week uh, before the NAACP got us out. Awesome. We're going to take a break. Um, Judy, thanks so much for talking with us so far, and we're going to come back and speak with you a little bit more. Uh, this is the Sickle Cell Action Network. I'm Gary. Hi, I'm Gary A. Gibson, your host for the Sickle Cell Action Network Internet Radio Show. If you are impacted by sickle cell disease in any way, whether you are a patient, a caregiver, or a friend, you need to join me every Tuesday at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. I promise that you will find our show to be full of information, perspective, and opinion about all things sickle cell. See you Tuesday right here on RadioNext.tv, the cool groove site. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to the Sickle Cell Action Network. I'm Gary A. Gibson, your host, and we are speaking with Judy Gray Johnson, um, the author of a book called Living with Sickle Cell Disease, The Struggle to Survive. And uh, she has so graciously and willingly given of herself to spend time with us today, and we're very, very grateful for that. Um, and we're going to continue the discussion because this woman apparently has lots and lots of strength, and, and we just want people to see that and feel the strength that she has. And one of the other areas, um, in addition to the things that we've already talked about, is that she's gone through some serious marital issues and and again she survived that um, and came out of that uh, in in pretty pretty strong fashion so Judy if you don't mind um, let me say that I found the marital discord chapter of your book to be interesting and I think it's yet another example of the things that you've had to overcome in your life so if you don't mind, would you please tell us a little bit about your experience with your ex-husband and the issues that you had with child support, um, those things that you had to work through. And, and you know, by the way, your, your marriage did produce um, a daughter, uh, Lori, and um, apparently she's very, um, very important to you, and, and apparently you're very important to her. So if you don't mind, could you kind of just give us an overview of some of that? You know, uh, yes. What I tried to show there is that, you know, I think that the audience can identify with, I'm sure you all know someone that has been through divorce, and um, 
child support issues and all of that. Sometimes, sometimes you get some of your child support money and, and not others, not all of it. But anyway, it was a very trying time. And the reason that that is there is because, you know, in addition to the, the sickle cell did not uh, abate itself. Said, you know, that, that we did not, we couldn't put that on the side and say, well, I'm going through this now, so you'll have to <laughs> right. wait. But right. I wanted you to, the, the, the audience to know that in addition to the sickle cell, I still have to go through the same thing that many of you have gone through. You see, now, not necessarily perhaps marital discard uh, and all, but you having to go it alone, not having the uh, support in the community um, or, you know, elsewhere, family and, and uh, you know, in the community, and yet you have a child to support. What do you do? You receive no training with how to be a parent. So, I mean, listen, my daughter and I have been together uh, alone since she was 13 months old. So, I mean, what am I going to do with a child at 13 months old, and yet I'm having uh, these uh, more frequent attacks now? So that was very important. And, I, and also, I was hoping that it would inspire others that if, uh, you know, not to let whatever it is, whatever obstacles that pop up in your life, not to let that uh, hold you back or to you know, make you feel ashamed that, that perhaps you can't do this, you can't do that, or you shouldn't, or you shouldn't talk about it or something. But I, it was to, to inspire others to keep going. And um, so I had a, this child that meant the world to me. And when I thought about what I went through to have her, which was very difficult, uh, a, a very difficult pregnancy, then I felt like I owed it to her to give her the very best education that I could. But then here is the problem, and that is by being the single parent, the everything in her life, I could not maintain a job and be the parent that I knew I should be. And, uh, provide a roof over our heads. So what I did, I had to, um, after trying out to various schools, I did find a school for my daughter and um, because I needed to make sure that the school required something of her. And they did. Because I knew that whatever they would tell her to do or ask of her, she did it. So she had to carry the burden of doing her job, and that was doing well in school. My job was to try to make a way, you know, for us to make sure that, uh, let's say, there was a roof over our heads and clothes, you know, and that kind of thing. Uh, but one thing I want the audience to understand, Bob, you will uh, know in my book, that my daughter received a first class education, and she did. I want you to understand that I did not raise her to be my caretaker. I needed a caretaker, but I didn't raise her to be my caretaker. I wanted to make sure, uh, first of all, that she didn't have the disease, and I had her uh, tested many, many times. And so when I found that she didn't have the disease, she was healthy and all, I wanted her to learn how to enjoy life. Um, so whatever my life was, was not much. I raised her to be the opposite of me. You wow, see? yeah. I, and, that's, and, that's, and that's what I did. And, um, and, and because I knew that one day, you know, I wanted her to be intelligent, to be able to enjoy life, uh, to do well in school, and determine, you know, her... Uh, um, what she was going to do in life. But uh, in order to do that, you have to know something. Right, right. You know? Right. And that's that's so, all. Uh, that is really, really, really cool. Lis listening to that is really cool, Judy. Um, yeah. On, on page 85 in the Cushy Chairs chapter, or excuse me, chapter, 
You told us about how you had to drive home from the hospital while you were still under the influence of narcotics. Yes. W would you please read some of that for us? I always tried my best not to draw attention to myself. However, the most egregious incidents stand out in my memory. One day at the end of school, a crisis began in my leg. Somehow, I was able to get the message to the principal. She came down to my room and escorted me up to the teacher's lounge. Not once did she reach out to assist me in any way. I had to hobble along, unassisted, in excruciating pain. It was not until I got to the teacher's lounge that someone called an ambulance. This particular crisis resulted in an eight-day hospital stay. I laid flat on my back, received an oxygen, IV fluids, and morphine every four hours. There was no attempt to wean me off any medication or to help me get my strength back before discharge. I did not even walk myself to the bathroom and back. I remained flat on my back. Suddenly, on the eighth day, at about eight o'clock at night, the doctor came in and abruptly told me I had to leave because the insurance companies would no longer pay for my treatment. Since I arrived at the hospital in an ambulance, my car was still at school. Sometimes during the week, a colleague drove my car to the hospital so I would have a way to get home once I was released. Still under the influence of narcotics, I fumbled around in the parking lot to locate my vehicle and then drove myself 20 miles to my home. Jeez. Incredible. Incredible. Uh, you know, so there's a lot that it, it's, you don't believe it. It's, you really don't believe it, and there's a lot that we have to do that's still to be done with this. I mean, uh, you, you get this, there's not the, the drugs that we are treated with, you know, are very potent drugs. And uh, no consideration is given to how are you, when you leave there, how are you getting home, and if you do have to drive, well, who's driving you? And uh, are, you in a, are you in a position to drive yourself and all? But you did what you had to do, and that's what they did. In other words, kicked me out, and, you know, after eight days, and, uh, you know, I, that's it. I had to go. Wow. Well, you know, I know that that still happens. Um, in fact, I just heard a story earlier today about a patient with sickle cell disease who uh, was actually released sooner than they wanted to be released because they didn't feel like their pain had subsided enough but the doctors kept checking the vital signs and vital signs were all really pretty good including even the hemoglobin level but the pain was still very very strong and they just said I'm sorry you know we can't keep you here you got to go and that still happens yep. today is what I'm trying to say um, yes. You do talk a lot about hospitals in your book, and, and that's because, like many sickle cell patients, you've had a lot of experience with them. Also, like many sickle cell patients, um, some of those experiences weren't so good, just like the one you just talked about. So much so that you started taking matters into your own hands. And this is something that I think is really impressive about you. And I really wanted to be sure that we had the chance to share that. You know, Judy, you, um, you took matters into your own hands. And so tell us a little bit about that, please. Well, I knew that I needed documentation. And when I went to the hospitals, I usually was there by myself. There was, uh, uh, sickle cell is so unpredictable. Uh, uh, it's sort of difficult to have somebody to uh, take you to the hospital at a certain time because you never know when you're going to get down sick. So what I did is that when things would happen in the hospital uh, and I was able to recount so much of it, I would try to memorize as much as I could right then and there and um uh, I always had that telephone right next to my bed. And as soon as someone would step out, I would dial my phone number at home and leave a message to myself uh, detailing the events that had just occurred. Because I knew I would need this information 
in order to, uh, you know, uh, to make um, to file my complaint later on. And so that's how I was able to keep up with uh, a lot that went on. And a lot did go on, I tell you. There, there's not time now uh, that you just have to read my book. <laughs> right. uh, about right. uh, you know the things that went on it, it's unbelievable well, the things that I went through and um, that I have endured one such thing is and the, you know uh, that uh, I don't think you know uh, that I don't want people to mention to miss is is that when I went to the emergency room on one occasion um, that um, they released me uh, after only a few hours, having given me uh, morphine and, uh, you know, without allowing enough time for it to wear off and kick me out in the street. And so morphine is, is a drug, whereas when you start undergoing motion, and that is just moving around, okay, uh -huh. uh, from, the, from the bed to standing up, dressing and all of that, uh, I had to do that, and by the time and they kicked me out, they were not going to let me stay there. So I knew that by the time I got my into my car, I said, "Oh my gosh, let me just make it home," because uh, you know I knew that I was about to throw up. Well, I drove maybe a couple of blocks, and I had to pull over the the, the car over to the side right quick, and hang my head out the door, and uh, you know throw up. And then I said, okay, oh my goodness, all right, maybe that provided a little bit of relief. Let me see if I can now make it on home. But I was able to, uh, I didn't make it on home then. After uh, so many blocks down the road, I had to pull over again. This was in a neighborhood. I was taking some shortcuts in order to get home. And uh, I really, really just threw up all of the medication that uh, they had given me. And uh, so after I got through throwing up there, um, I can only imagine what the people thought when they walked out of their house the next morning to see what was there oh, in oh, front geez. of their house. Jeez. You see? Yes. Because uh, they would have seen that somebody had gotten very sick. Okay. And so, uh, but anyway, I just didn't have to. But that's. But then the question is this: is that if I had gotten into an accident, who would have been responsible? That's a good question, and I who read that in your book, and I thought that is a good question. Yeah. So luckily, I didn't get into an accident. Uh, that was late at night. In fact, it was after one o'clock in the morning. Uh -huh. And. Uh, you know, but yet I didn't have anybody with me, and uh, there was nobody, uh, you know, I come from a very small family, I think maybe, I can't remember, perhaps my daughter was away at school at the time, uh, she, uh, her school was about 500 miles away. You know, so just, just, Judy, that is a really good question, and, and I'm not an attorney, but I, I've dealt with attorneys a lot through my career, and, and I would almost venture to say that they would say that you were responsible because even though you were discharged, it was you who took on the, um, you who decided to drive. Well, it's not a matter of deciding to drive. What other choices did I have? I, I understand that, but knowing knowing how the law works, uh, somebody's going to throw that argument out there, I'll bet you. We're going to take one last okay. break, and then when we come back, we'll continue and finish our discussion with the wonderful Judy Gray Johnson. This is the Sickle Cell Action Network. I'm Gary A. Okay. Gibson, your host. The Sickle Cell Action Network. I'm Gary A. Gibson, your host. The Sickle Cell Action Network show is sponsored by Mass Therapeutics, a publicly traded by a pharmaceutical company headquartered in San Diego, California. MAST is currently leveraging the molecular adhesion and sealant technology platform derived from over two decades of clinical, non-clinical, and manufacturing experience with purified and non-purified palaxomers. MAST has developed a drug called MST-188 as a candidate for serious or life-threatening diseases with significant unmet needs. Among those needs is the treatment of sickle cell disease. MAST has enrolled sickle cell patients in a clinical trial known as EPIC. EPIC stands for Evaluation of Purified Palaxomer in Crisis. If successful, EPIC could result in the first treatment of its kind to treat sickle cell disease patients while they are in crisis. 
the EPIC study aims to determine whether MST-188 can shorten the duration of a painful crisis. MST-188 is an investigational drug that has not been approved for commercial sale in any jurisdiction for any use. MST-188 potentially improves oxygen delivery and it may help keep blood vessels from becoming blocked and more obstructed. It may improve blood flow by stopping cells from grouping together. It also may reduce inflammation and it may restore cell membranes and give damaged cells time to heal. EPIC participants continue to receive their normal pain treatments during crisis and their participation is free of charge to them. The patients involved in the EPIC study may not only be helping themselves, but they might also be helping future generations of those yet to be born. If you're interested in learning more about the EPIC study, please visit www.theepicstudy.com. So we're speaking with Judy Gray Johnson, the author of Living with Sickle Cell Disease, The Struggle to Survive, having a great conversation with her. Um, and we're going to pick that conversation up, and we're going to talk about something we haven't talked about yet. Um, and so what we haven't talked about yet is that you have a master's degree in special education. And not only have you taught children for many, many years, you've also served two terms as a teacher's union president. How did you manage to do all of that with sickle cell in your life, Judy? Well, what I did, I learned how to pace myself. And first of all, when I, let me just say this, when I went on my jobs and I was interviewed for, for teaching positions, I did not mention the fact that I had sickle cell. And um, so um, I learned, as I said, I learned how to pace myself. And so I immediately, uh, well, what I would do, I would go on the, uh, the uh, website to find out what was the focus of uh, the main focus for that particular grade level that I was teaching and that, you know, my supervisors were going to be looking for, you know, um, with uh, language arts activities or science uh, uh, interests, whatever. So I learned how to do this and I memorized it, okay? Uh -huh. And so then I paced myself. So I had to determine how much, in other words, I had to get to the school early earlier than most teachers and I left much later than they did because I slowly paced myself in terms of preparing for my students. The fact that I had sickle cell, they did, that did not, uh, I did not slight any of my students because of that. In fact, if anything, I think I uh, put a tremendous burden on myself. <laughs> So, uh, excuse me, uh, because, uh, so I'm, you know, it's, it's the pressure, I put the pressure on myself. So, uh, in other words, um, I made sure that I worked very closely with my, um, you know, um, uh, of, of the, of fellow teachers, and that's on the same grade level with me. So we planned, there's a lot of planning activities together and so on. But now, I learned how to do that over a period of time. So teaching and being, uh, you know, a sickle cell patient, I did, I, I did not, uh, I didn't, you know, I was able to handle that pretty good. The only thing is I did miss quite a bit of time from school, and, um, but I, I rarely, uh, especially during the early years that I'd say why I was out of school, okay? Uh -huh. But now when it came to be a teacher's union president, that was uh, that was a bit much. And I have to say, I did not feel as successful as I could have. Teacher school was one thing, but leading a group of, uh, of <laughs> teachers yes. um, across the county is another. Yeah. So what I did, I relied on the people in my office. I didn't even tell them that I had sickle cell. And so um, I learned how to, to work with others and to give others um, responsibilities. So in other words, while I was the president of the union, we had some little mini presidents within the different departments, you see, mm -hmm. um, because they would uh, be in charge of whatever area it is that they had to do. And, um, but it, it was it was not a good, uh, you know, I, I found it very, very difficult to do. And in fact, I didn't serve two years, uh, two terms. I served three terms as the president. 
And the only way that I eventually, you know, it wasn't their president because during the, the last election, I was beat out by, you know, a fellow uh, teacher. And I, frankly, I, that, that was the happiest time of my year of my life, my professional life, because I just, you know, I could just, I, there was nobody that I could talk to that I could say. And then, you know, it, it was a tremendous burden. I can imagine that it was, uh, but it, again, right. it, it shows your strength that you you were able to do that for three terms. So that that's impressive. Um, yeah. On page mm-hmm. 104 and 105, you talk about how the head of the emergency department designated himself as your personal physician. Would you read some of that section for us? Uh, let's see. The next morning, my discharge um, occurred rather abruptly. I told the doctor I had no one to pick me up from the hospital until late afternoon. The nurse told me that the checkout was usually at 11 o'clock in the morning and she would speak to a social worker. They arranged for a cab to take me home. I have to admit that this was the fastest discharge I'd ever experienced from a hospital. So as you can imagine, I was not one of the most popular patients among the emergency room and general hospital staff. Nevertheless, I did not go to the hospital to be liked. I went for treatment. Unfortunately, sickle cell anemia is a very painful disease. To to stabilize a sickle cell patient, medical personnel must immediately administer oxygen, intravenous fluids, and administer pain medication through the use of IV. Until this is done, I am unable to feel relief. Morphine helped me to feel better. Uh, without treatment, I would try cry uncontrollably because self-centered and uh, become self-centered and lose all semblance of dignity. I imagine the disease affects others differently, but that there are many similarities for those of us living with sickle cell disease. So if you want to know what sickle cell anemia pain feels like, imagine placing your hands flat on the table and hitting the tips of your fingers with a hammer. The resulting pain radiates throughout the arm for an undetermined length of time. With sickle cell anemia, the radiating pain is constant until the patient receives pain medication. Eventually, the head of the emergency department finally designated himself as my personal physician for for whenever I arrived in the emergency room. In other words, he treats me whenever I come in with crisis symptoms. Uh, the reason for that is that, uh, the, you know, the word had gotten around in the emergency room. Anytime a sickle cell patient comes in, the staff really does not want to treat us. That's because they do not understand us and what to do for us. Right. So therefore, um, you know, to, 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 for, to get treatment for me, it would take a little bit longer because I had to wait until, uh, well, I couldn't understand it at first why I had to wait so long until finally, every time, he would show up, the, uh, the head of the department. So I said, this is how they're handling this. I said this to myself. So we go through this ritual. He asked me these questions, uh, you know, about uh, my pain and how often and all this. And I'm thinking, you know, this is not the first time we've been through this. <laughs> right. but, he, but he acted like uh, um, it's almost as if nobody else wanted to treat me. And so he was the one that he put himself in that place of being my doctor any time I came in. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. You know, um as we get closer to wrapping up the show, though, um, there's a section that I wanted to read, um, and it goes like this, and this is in the last chapter. It says, as sickle cell patients, we have to create our own caring, nurturing treatment environments. As stated in the previous chapter, I have had more than my share of inappropriate treatment at the hands of those who were supposed to be caring for me. What the medical professionals did not know or seem to understand was the sheer will on my part to survive. As I've chronicled in these pages, I carried my fight against sickle cell into all arenas of my life. My battle reached a culmination when I finally had enough and began to challenge the hospitals and their staff on what I considered their rude, insensitive, and unprofessional treatment. That treatment prompted me to write this book. 
writing this book is one of the biggest victories of my journey. And that, I think, is so well said and sums up Judy Gray Johnson in a very, very clear and concise manner. Judy, uh, thank you for talking with us today. But before we let you go, um, I wanted to ask you, um, how can readers get a copy of your book? Living with sickle cell disease, the struggle to survive, uh, at, from Amazon.com. Okay, so living and with so disease, the struggle to survive. The author is Judy Gray Johnson, J U D Y G R A Y J O H N S O N. With Leroy Williams Jr. With Leroy Williams Jr. I'm sorry to have forgotten that. Um, so now um, let's. Take us, let's talk about something else special that you're working on these days. And, and would you go ahead and tell us a little bit about the um, sickle cell educational resources? What is that, and, and how is that going? Well, I'll tell you what. Um, it's um, we, all of the things, that the problems and obstacles that we've uh, discussed earlier in this program, uh, it's leading up to what we're, we're doing right now. And um, one of the uh, problems, uh, the main obstacles, I think, with the sickle cell, with uh, an awareness of sickle cell, is that I'm appalled at the lack of education in our schools. And so we have developed a and uh, a, prog- a um, program, sickle cell educational resources, in which we are targeting high school students. Okay, uh-huh. we have got to get. Uh, you know, the information out there, and we have to get accurate information out there. So, um, because there is a lack of education, uh, not only are students suffering when they go to school, um, the, uh, the, 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 what the what the educators don't know, they have adults there with sickle cell, and they probably have not said anything about their condition, but... There's so much more that you could, they can do and they should do in order to make um, uh, the educational experience more meaningful for those students and uh, employees. So that's what educational, uh, uh, the um, sickle cell educational resources is all about. And so what we've done, we uh, what I did is uh, we took... Um, the first book, Living with Sickle Cell, The Struggles to Survive, we tweaked that a little bit. And um, it's Living with Sickle Cell, The Inside Story. And it's specifically geared for the high school students. In addition to that, which what I found that is needed is that people will t- uh, take a book, read it, and say, okay, I know everything there is, and they'll put it on a shelf. But this is not a book that can be put on, that should be put on a shelf. We have developed a curriculum guide to accompany the um, to accompany the um, inside story. Okay, to uh-huh, help right. to guide our language arts teachers in understanding what this disease is all about. And uh, in fact, uh, we uh, have aligned it with the educational standards that each of our states have gone through. You know, and that they have set for their students in their particular state. In other words, uh, they are saying that in the state of California, you, uh, our students must be able to do this, this, and this. Well, we have identified all of that so you, they don't, the educators don't have to do anything different than uh, what they're doing now. The material that we have developed fits right in with their educational program. So not only are they learning what sickle cell is, okay, and uh, how it affects you and so on, uh, they, it also helps them to develop character education, you see? Yes, uh, yes. So, uh-huh. Okay. And so uh, while we said that in the book that we, we, uh, that, uh, after we think is appropriate for ninth and 10th graders, I think I'd go so far as to say I would um, strongly recommend that this program be uh, initiated at the ninth grade level. I think that every kid coming through that school at the ninth grade level should be uh, have a special um, class on, uh, you know, living with sickle cell 
because, as I said, they will learn uh, not only about sickle cell, but character education, health education, guidance, uh, English, uh, science. So there's so much there that is uh, incorporated, you see? Sure. And so, and, uh, so in good. So well, now. What we'd like to do is, is recommend that people check that website out, and it's Sickle Cell Educational Resources. Just Google yes. that, and you'll find it. And I took a look at the page, and I see some really good stuff there. So, Judy, thank you for that. Um, I'm going to wrap up here with asking you, if you would, what, in your from your perspective, what are the top three things that are giving you hope about Sickle Cell for the future? Okay, let's see. But, okay. Uh, what, number one is that um, uh, it's given me hope because there, is, there are more and more people beginning to get involved uh, with this disease, trying to seek more information. And it's important that um, we as patients make sure that we have a hand in this because uh, you know, it, it, they must. Um, we must make sure that the patient's point of view is always heard. You know, heard, and it's a part of that. So this educational program that we have developed for the high schools uh, is definitely will make a will go a long ways towards not only educating our students, but just think, every year you get a different group of ninth graders. Right. You see? Uh -huh. So, uh, and then eventually, these students are going to uh, eventually uh, leave high school, go out into the world, and of course, more and more, that's just, just one of it, you see? So, our if we can get the our, uh, high schools more involved, uh, that's what gives me hope. Okay? Great. Okay. All right. Yes. Well, Judy, thank you so much for being with us today on the Sickle Cell Action Network. Um, mm -hmm. You've been a great guest, and I thank you for the example that you give um, as you continue to struggle and defeat sickle cell disease. Ladies and gentlemen, you have been listening to Judy Gray Johnson, the author of Living with Sickle Cell Disease, The Struggle to Survive. Judy, I hope that uh, we get a chance to talk with you again sometime soon. Okay, thank you. All right, have a great evening. So it's time to close the show, and as always, um, here's something for you to think about. Today we start with a closing quote that says, Believe me, the reward is not so great without the struggle. And these are the words of Wilma Rudolph. Wilma Rudolph, who lived from 1940 to 1994, was an American track and field sprinter who competed in the 100 and 200 meter dash. Rudolph was considered the fastest woman in the world in the 1960s and competed in two Olympic Games in 1956 and in 1960. In the 1960 Summer Olympics in Rome, she became the first American woman to win three gold medals in track and field during a single Olympic Games. As a member of the black community, she is also regarded as a civil rights and women's rights pioneer. Life is hard in one way or another for just about everybody. Some people are burdened with poverty. Others wrangle with hunger. Still others battle with mental illnesses. And still others have to fight through lives with chronic illnesses like sickle cell disease. And even though people sometimes seem to share in the same struggles, we know that no two people are alike. That means that no two struggles are alike either. Our struggles are highly personal affairs. They not only can hamper our ability to be happy at times, they sometimes can make our lives seem as futile as finding that proverbial pot of gold under the rainbow. This can be especially true for someone who has to wake up every day knowing that their physical situation isn't going to change. But guess what? Even though their physical condition may not be changing, the fact is that their attitude is not bound by the same limitations. We can change our minds and we can change our outlook on things. This, where, this is where it becomes a situation of mind over matter. This is how we overcome our struggles. 
Over the last several months, I've interviewed lots and lots of sickle cell patients who have demonstrated they, they have been able to overcome their challenges. In each and every case, the way that they have done this is by being determined to not let their illness get in their way. It has been so impressionable for me to hear their stories that I wish every person alive could hear them too. The way that these warriors live their lives reminds me of that old saying about making lemon aid out of lemon aid out of lemons. As you know, I think that their heroic stories are overcoming and they are as refreshing as that cold glass of lemonade on a hot summer day. The great jazz musician Herbie Hancock once said, It's part of life to have obstacles. It's about overcoming obstacles. That's the key to success and happiness. Yeah, I know. This is one of those things that is easier said than done. But I also know that overcoming obstacles is possible when you program your mind to believe that you can. Anyone and everyone who has ever accomplished any kind of success has done so by believing that it was possible. It doesn't matter if it's Barack Obama, LeBron James, Tiger Woods, Prince, Beyonce, or anybody else who had to fight through their personal struggles to get where they wanted to go. They got there by convincing themselves that they could do what it was they were trying to do. The thing that these successful individuals have in common with the rest of us, including those who battle chronic illnesses like sickle cell, is that they are human too. If they can overcome their struggles with mental attitude, it means that anyone else should be able to do so also. As they say, all you have to do is want it. So remember what Wilma Rudolph said, the reward is not so great without the struggle. And remember also what is implied but not said in that statement, the greater the struggle, the greater the reward. If you have sickle cell disease, have faith that you will see a great reward one day, and I promise you that one day you will. That's our show for today. Please join us again next week, same time, same station.